The message today is called The God of Second Chances. And, you know, over the past five weeks with Denisha, what she started with her message, there has been kind of a theme that, that's going through this, that each, each sermon has kind of picked up where the last one left, left off, topically speaking. And this is, uh, this is an important thing to consider because it's an important part of our, our faith. I mean, if you've ever been given a second chance, and most people have, it's in your life you've been given a second chance of something and made the most of it. We need second chances because second chances are what turns mistakes into experience. And the more experience we have, the better we do, right? And so this applies, though, not just to uh, resumes and things like that, but personal relationships we learn, we learn all the valuable lessons we need. We learn right around Judah's age, don't we? Yes, yeah, we do. To build, start building friendships and relationships, that all starts in kindergarten. You know, put things back where you found them. Share. What I wish was still here is everyone takes a nap after lunch and wakes up with an orange drink and a cookie to set you right, get you centered, get your mood together. That's a good one. Another important one. Uh, one of the most valuable ones I learned, I can still remember they put it in song form. Don't bite your friends. <laughs> Don't bite your friends, right? Yeah, all these lessons, they start teaching us when we're kids about how to navigate through relationships, how to get through them. But in all seriousness, second chances give us the experience necessary for continuing to cultivate our relationship with God and each other. And, and you know, even though we say second chances, let's be honest, um, a lot of times we're talking about a ninth or a tenth chance that we have, that we've been given, just to get something right. And Jesus died for sins, past, present, and future. He's not subject to time. I've talked about that extensively in another message, and I will again. God's forgiveness rises above any forgiveness that man can possibly fathom, and he's not subject to time. But the success... The success of a second chance, and this is a theme that's going to probably pop up a few times in this message, is directly related to repentance. You know, repentance. Like when I, I've talked before about people say, can you lose your salvation? I say, well, sal did you have it in the first place? Salvation's a gift. Uh, to receive a gift requires an act of extending your arm and opening your hand. Metaphorically, that's repentance. That's re did you do that to get the gift in the first place? But repentance is vital when asking for a second chance. You know, when we say second chance, that term carries a common understanding that when we fail God, he doesn't stop pursuing us. He doesn't stop pursuing us. That's biblical. Pursuing our hearts by giving us opportunities to try again and again and again. And there, I know there's a literal term when we say it sounds like it just a, you know, maybe an analogy, second chance only the second time and that's true We're, that happens sometimes there are some things that if you fail the first time around appealing for a second chance in this world is a little harder if you're convicted for murder and you're going before a parole board and trying to con you know convince them why you should be given a second chance that th that decision comes with a lot of gravity, and I'll, it's pretty tricky for them to make that decision. But it, in this world, a heavy weight comes with that. But despite our flaws in terms of God, despite our transgressions, our outright sins committed in rebellion, if we repent, we seek a second chance with authenticity and with obedience, he seems to grant them in a limitless capacity. And again, it comes back to authenticity, obedience. That's part of the repentance thing. People say, well, God's, God said he forgive me. That God says he forgives me. That's a two-part, there's a two-way street in that relationship. Our God is a God of second chances. And in the context of this, it's getting life right. You need another chance to get life right. Hit the reset button with Jesus Christ as your pilot. And we, we all, look, I don't, I mean, we all do it. We've all, I look back on my life and I know that I have faced some times when I just failed miserably. Moments when we've stumbled or missed the mark or felt like we've let God down. They're not that uncommon. But we just did a podcast yesterday. We talked, um, 
uh, day before yesterday where we kind of talked about this. Instead of looking at failure as something that defines you, you should choose to see it as an opportunity to let God's grace shine through and the second time around, prove you trust him by tr trying to get it right. Trying not to walk away from him to make the same mistakes, making your decisions and taking the appropriate actions and obedience. So this is where we get into the, the, the examples, the kind of people we're talking about, right? We, we relate, we're relatable to people in the Bible, people that have had these things happen. And we're going to look at the life of Peter first, a disciple who exemplifies this, this entire principle. Peter's journey teaches us that even in our most significant failures, God can and will still use us for his glory. And just a brief mention here, this is why we fight off guilt, because that's one of the enemy's most, most powerful tools for breaking us down. Because guilt tries to lure you into believing that you are still and will always be the same person who failed, who made the failure. That's what guilt tried. Guilt should, guilt should be a visitor, but never a tenant. Guilt should be a visitor, but never a tenant. So back to Peter. A, a, a failure with a purpose. Peter, you know, he was originally Simon, and then Jesus renamed him Peter, which is actually Petra, because Petra means rock, and he said, you're the rock on which I'll build my church. The English version is Peter. Anyway, he was Simon, and then Jesus renamed him Peter. He was a fisherman called to be a disciple, and his journey with Jesus was filled with uh, remarkable moments of faith and boldness. But he had profound failure. In Matthew 26, 69 through 75, there is a heart-wrenching account of Peter's denial of Christ. After bravely, after telling Jesus, I'll never leave you, I'll never deny you, I'm with you till the end, I would never turn my back on you. And then the next morning, in the courtyard of the priest, if memory serves me correct, I think this was instigated by a little girl. He, he, he was asked about knowing Jesus, and he flat out denied it. He flat out denied, I don't know him. You were with him, I saw you. Nope, never met him. You're Jesus' friend, I see you with him all the time. I don't know him. Three times, three times in a row. And you think about that moment, it must have been really, 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 really heavy because, you know, the night before, he had just told Jesus, I'll never turn my back on you, and Jesus said, you, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows in the morning. And then as soon as he denied him, the rooster crows. That's like a gut punch. That would really make you think, oh man, look what I've done. I mean, that's, you talk about a hard pill to swallow. Peter wept bitterly, overwhelmed by sh his shame. But like us, Peter's failure isn't the end of his story. After Jesus' resurrection, there's a powerful moment in John 21 where Peter encounters the risen Christ. In his grace, he asks Peter, do you love me? And you know, I've talked about this whole exchange a lot, but for the sake of time today, we're going to just keep the relevant points here. He asked him, do you love me three times? And he affirmed his love, and Jesus' response was, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So this is not just a restoration of Peter. It is a commissioning. It's not, he, Jesus was saying, I still have purpose for you. I know you failed me, but I'm not just going to make it right and make you right with me. I'm giving you something to do. I'm giving you something to do. The beautiful exchange reveals the heart of God. No matter how far that we stray away. And there are people that think they've gone too far. There are people who think they've gone too far from Jesus to come back, but he's always ready to restore us. Peter went on to be the foundational leader in the early church. I, he, he, he was. Boldly preaching the gospel on the day of Pentecost, he led thousands to Christ, and his failure was transformed into a platform for a powerful ministry. And he wasn't the only one that went through these failures, though. There's a lot of people who, some people in the Bible failed to such extents that a lot of men would have said, I, you know what, I'm not fit for this. There are some people that even will, will, will discourage with that kind of thinking. They say, I'm not fit to lead this place. And you go, oh, no, you're fine. Then they'll share something with you and you go, yeah, you should quit. I didn't know you were that bad. And people do. They'll, they, they, sometimes they'll discourage each other. But his isn't the only one. There was also Moses. Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egypt 
he had a big failure. He killed someone. I mean, <laughs> that's a big deal. You, when you read it in the Bible, you just kind of read over it like it's a fairy tale. This is a real event. He killed someone. Now, he was defending Jewish people, but imagine God says, I want you to lead my people out, and you, go, and you start having this dialogue with God spiritually, literally. You're going to lead people out, and then you kill someone. You're like, oh, wow, is this... I bet this is not going to look good. This is not going to look good. So he fled. He went into the desert and said, I can't, I can't even, I can't kill people and, and lead people out and represent God. He felt unworthy. But God called him back, just like Peter. Jesus said, come here. We're not done. I got, I got something for you to do. God, through the burning bush, God uses Moses to perform miracles and lead his people to freedom. That is all in Exodus 3 through 4 which I didn't want to turn the, the message into me standing here reading the Bible without taking out what we need for application. And then my favorite, and the one I'll probably talk about the longest because of his monumental failures, is David. And the reason I like David so much for this illustration is because the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. I mean, David did a lot of things. You're like, wow, God would say that about him? Really? I mean, you know, same David, David and Goliath slew, went on to become the king. A man's after, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he orchestrated the murder of her husband, the death of her husband, not the murder, the death of her husband, rather, to, to cover his tracks. And the consequences were dire, dire. But after being confronted by the prophet Nathan, and that is a vicious story of someone getting busted, I mean, he was busted. He gets confronted by the prophet Nathan, and David repented deeply. This is all 2 Samuel 11 through 12. God, God still restored David. And despite his sin, he went on to write many of the Psalms and is a key figure in the, in the lineage of Jesus, in the bloodline of Jesus. Here's another, just a brief mention here. Sometimes getting busted is a good thing. We need some of the best lessons I ever learned in life is because I got, got caught. I got in trouble. And it made me do a lot of soul searching and self reflection. I wasn't just mad because I got caught. When I had to pay the consequences, I started thinking about what I did and why it's wrong. It reminds us that we need to have that brief visit with guilt so we can get started on that second chance and why it's important. When I was in, doing a prison ministry, I told some of these guys, uh, well, a whole room full of them, I said, some of you are better off in here if you want to be right with God, because if you get out, you're going to go back to doing what you did before. And then I couldn't believe I said that. And, um, but it came out, and some of them looked at me puzzled, but the rest of them, I mean, I'm still here. So, But having, having a hard life here on earth may be the only thing that guarantees that second chance of getting into heaven. That was kind of the point I was making to them. Things, we go back asking for a second chance. It doesn't mean that God's just going to wipe the board clean and life's going to be rosy again. We know that. Jesus never lied. So back a few minutes ago when I was talking about God's limitless capacity for giving second chances, it's important to take notice of something that we learned from David's situation. And this is really important. First of all, even though God gave David a second chance, there was severe consequences for his actions. Severe consequences for his actions. David's life would not see the original glory that was destined to be his. And instead, a lot of it would go on to his son. But David never complained because his repentance, his desire to have a second chance and want to make things right with God, was sincere. He genuinely wept over his sins. I mean, he felt awful. Once he got caught and it, it, it comes spilling out what he had done and he had to face his sins, he did. He felt terrible. He wept over it. People, people plead with God sometimes. God, please, if you help me, I'll never do it again. Then they go back and do it again. David prayed that prayer and he meant it. He said that. He meant it. Even after God brought the harsh consequences down on him like a hammer, you know, the, the, the verses go on long in the Bible. But 
But basically what they say is, David, this is God, I'm paraphrasing. I've given you everything, everything you've ever wanted. And I would have given you more if you asked me for it. But you sinned against me. I'm going to kill your kid. I'm taking all your wives. I'm going to give them to other men right in your face. And you're going to see it all happen. Everything you've had is going to collapse. I am going to decorate you with punishment. Harsh. I'm telling you, read it. That's what it says. It's a lot more stretched out than that. But that's what it says. And David accepted it. He's like, okay. Okay. He accepted accountability because he was genuinely seeking restoration with God. I want a second chance. What? Second chance to make everything right here? (laughs) I want a second chance to make everything right with God. So I can be in eternity with God in heaven I'm going to have to face the consequences a lot of times for what I've done here. We learn from this that our willingness to accept accountability is a testament to our sincerity when we go before God asking for parole, right? Asking for parole, that big second chance. But, you know, God's grace, God doesn't always punish people. His grace, he often gives us a second chance, and sometimes there's no consequences, they, I remember when I, I was a horrible alcoholic when I quit drinking after I finally was clearing the smoke out of my life and beginning my path into ministry and I had quit drinking. I went to the doctor. I said, yeah, well, you know, I need to get checked up. And I told him I'm taking this life path and all this stuff. And, and he, he asked me how much I drank and I told him. And um, he made me take blood tests. And then afterwards, you know, I wanted to check my liver because my friend died. And I went back and he said, uh, <clears throat> you know, I want you to come to my office to talk to me. And I thought, oh, this isn't going to be good. So, and, then, and he said, you know, your blood work came back and it, did, it doesn't make sense. It's inconsistent with what you told me. And I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you told me, were you honest about how much you drank? And I said, maybe not entirely. And he said, that would explain a lot. And, and he said, so you didn't drink that much. I go, oh, no, that, that wasn't the nature of my lie. <laughs> I said it was quite the opposite direction. And he said, really? Well, uh, you know, your liver enzymes are only slightly elevated. And for someone who has drank as long and hard as you have, it doesn't make sense. And I said, wow, that's, I don't know what to say. And he said, he said, well, and I'll never forget this. When somebody says something this profound, you don't forget it. He said, it appears that you've been given a second chance. And I said, really? And he goes, and he, he, he was looking at the paper. He goes, don't blow it. I never forgot that. That's heavy. That was a heavy part of my life. And I, I thought, wow. And that was a long time ago. But I didn't reap the consequences for my sin. Now, this is all important to think about because we, we can't blame God when the difficult circumstances that may linger in the world do come to visit us. And we, we have to ask ourselves what we're wanting a second chance for. Is what I'm living for worth Jesus is dying for? We have to understand what we're at. Our transgressions, when he extends a grace of giving us a second chance. Sometimes consequences are dire. Sometimes God withholds them like he did me. In any case, he always does what's right. And we often don't understand. That's where faith and trust comes back. I suppose God spared me punishment because I was entering into his service and maybe he was giving me mercy. But David, on the other hand, was already leading God's people and he should have known better. He should have known better than what he did. It takes a tough punishment to discipline a tough man. And God knew that with David. Even though he was, you know, he did call him a man after his own heart. David was violent. Now, I'm not putting David down. I don't mean abusive. He, he wasn't unfair to people, but he was a violent warrior. He had a lot of blood on his hands. I'll tell you what, if David was leading Israel now, the day after October 7th last year, the whole Middle East would be scorched earth because that's how he would have dealt with it. He had a zero tolerance for people attacking, going against God's people. He, he, he was a tough guy. And God gave him a tough punishment, and he accepted it. 
And it's, it, it reminds me that we can't, we can't put, make some kind of proportional connection to, well, I've created a mess here. If God gives me a second chance, then that means these things will be easier to clean up. That's not true. It's like we just talked this on the podcast. This line came up from that movie, Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? When they got saved and baptized. And he said, you boys might be square with the Lord, but the state of Mississippi is a whole other matter. And that's, that goes for all of us when we get right with God. Sometimes we still have messes to clean up. And David had a lot to clean up because he had a lot of punishment coming his way. You have to search your heart and make sure that you're not seeking forgiveness or a second chance simply to escape accountability here on earth. Because if that's what your motivation is, it may come back harder on you. But rather because you want restoration with Christ. And the eternal perspective should always, always, always be our priority. Not what goes on from womb to tomb. What goes on to the great throne room. Uh, that's, that's it. There's a couple other people. I won't spend a lot of time on David, but I find him fascinating in so many ways. God still called him a man after his own heart. And the word of God, that is still there. Paul was another one. A fierce persecutor of Christians. Standing by while Stephen was murdered. Stoned to death. That's Acts 7, 58. But after a dramatic encounter with the risen Christ, Paul became one of the greatest evangelists in history, spreading the gospel and planting churches across a known world. That's all in Acts 9. And do we see a pattern here? We sure do. Paul, Peter, same thing that happened with Peter. You denied God. You turned your back on God. Not only has he given you a second chance, he's given you marching orders. Paul, same thing, but to a larger extent. So what do these stories tell us? When you, add, you pile them all up, they all, have, they all have recurring themes in them. They show us that our failures don't determine our future. And I say this, this year particularly, I've encountered people that are really that are afraid of their past. They're, they're, they're not trying to escape it or hide it. They, just, they feel like they're standing in its shadow. And, and it's, it was on my heart to, to bring this up. It is an important thing. God is the God of second chances. He specializes in redeeming broken lives. And here's the few, you can put the next slide up. These are the, some of the applications that come out of the stuff today. The first one right there, embrace, embrace God's grace. When we fail, our natural inclination may be to hide from God or wallow in shame. But instead, we should come to him with our failures and accept the grace. David accepted it. 1 John 1, 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Next, don't let fear hold you back. Just, just like Peter. We, we, we may fear that our past mistakes disqualify us from God's plan, but deeply, de when you're deeply driven and convicted and you repent, God will not only bring a second chance, but a new purpose. He does it all the time. That's why we see the lives of these people. And the, thirdly, the third one, the life application, is find your purpose in restoration. And this is a recurring theme that's been coming up now for about a month in different flavors. Remember, God often uses those who have walked through struggles to lead others to him. So your story, your failure, and your restoration is, is a powerful testimony of God's love and forgiveness. Look for opportunities to serve others, share your story, and encourage those who may be experiencing their own failures. And there's a lot of people who are failing at something and they don't, they don't know. I noticed one time when I got here, I don't know if it's still the case, I don't know if I've ever said this up here. <clears throat> um, and I turn the lights on sometimes and I go, I, if I go in in the morning, I see a light on, I look in the room, make sure in the women's restroom, I'm trying to explain why I was in the women's restroom. But I saw the things on the wall that say if you're pregnant, pregnancy or something, there's a number, and there's one about um, advice about abortions. They both had four tabs pulled off of them. And I, I don't know what that means. I don't know if it meant one person took one off each and was having some kind of tug of war. I don't know what that means. But boy, did that make me think. And it, I started thinking about these, these struggles people have that they don't share with people. You may look at somebody and they're going through something you just can't imagine. But we serve a God of second chances. As we start to wind down here, I want to remind you that no matter how far you've strayed, how many times you've stumbled, you're not defined by your failures. 
The condition with that, though, this isn't the prosperity gospel. <laughs> this, the condition to that is that you have a genuine, authentic concern for seeking God f- for when asking for your second chance. You serve God, who, you, we serve a God who loves us deeply and forgives and has a desire to restore us. Just as Peter was given a second chance, Romans 8, 1 tells us, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we let that sink in. You're free. I'm free. You're loved. You have purpose. So we must embrace the truth that we serve a God of second chances. And we can live our lives in his grace. The whole of humanity is about one big second chance, isn't it? I mean, it is. Man fell away from God. Jesus came to say, hey, if you believe in me, I can get you home. Would you like a second chance at this? That's, that's what all of humanity is. All testimonies start like that. They start like, well, I used to be this mess until I met Jesus, and now I'm this Second chance, getting life right. Of course, we still sin. We, we, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And the difference is, after finding Jesus, I now examine everything I think and do, and I hold it against God's standards. So I can be better than who I used to be. That's the whole Christian walk. The Christian walk is not what the world tells other hypocrites. We think we're better than other people. And all. I, don't, I don't think I'm better than anybody. I just know I'm better than who I used to be. And that's what Jesus gives each person individually. What you know, the person you know you can be better than is the person you used to be. Shouldn't matter to you if you think you're better than someone around you. That's not what Christianity is about. That's not what Christ gives us. Christ gives us the power through his, forgive, through his forgiveness to be better than who we used to be. So a second chance to get something right goes far beyond you know, just discontinuing a certain sin. And I, you know, if people can't say, I heard your message, pastor, I quit drinking too. Well, good for you. But the, the, the larger thing you should be seeking when you're seeking a second chance is being close to God, restoration of the relationship, not just, not just the quitting drinking. Sometimes it's, you know, the larger problem is I'm going to start participating in fellowship as commanded by God. I'm getting involved in the body of Christ directly. That's that's a good jump forward. That's a good jump forward. God will tap you on the shoulder and remind you that he is faithful in forgiveness and second chances. Just from the scriptures I just read, there's plenty more that teach the same thing. You're not treating your spouse right. You're not treating your spouse right. You feel like maybe God's tapping you on the shoulder. You want a second chance? You're not investing yourself in a Christian way in your relationships with your friends, with your kids today, but you're here. You want a second chance? You want to try to get that right? You're holding bitterness in with someone? Is someone in your heart that you just really are frosted at, you just can't get past it, and you'd like to find a way to forgive them? Would you like a second chance? You didn't get started on the right foot with someone you met a couple months ago, maybe at work. How about a second chance? Yeah. God's tapping you on the shoulder. He's always tapping us on the shoulder. Hey. Let's let's, (laughs) let's get this right. Come on now. You want a second chance? You want to do over? Do you care about me? Do you love me, Peter? I love you. All right. We're going to get a second chance. That's the God we serve. Your second chance, if something's hiding, something you need to fix, you got to have the relationship with the one who gives the second chance before you ask for the second chance. So make sure you're doing those two things together. We all need this advice. I need this advice. How many times do we need a second chance? Lots. But overall, in the scheme of things, it's one second chance at getting things right. All right.